Jeffries, and Matt Pangrad. BTL is brought to you by Lawrence. Lures. Striking Lures. Bass Cat Boats. Ducket Fishing. Spro. Apco. Sunline. And TH Marine. BTL coming at you. Good Tuesday, everybody. Welcome once again to BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Matthew, how you doing? I'm stumped. <laughs> what do you mean? Yesterday, you gave me some homework. I did. I did. And we're going to talk about it. What'd you find out? <laughs> I, I can't find out anything and how it relates to bass fishing in any way, shape, or form, Mark. You're kidding me. Lu Lewis or Louie? I think it's... L Luis. Luis? Yeah. Robert. Robert? Yeah. He's some baseball player. He is a baseball player. With the White Sox. Yeah. He's never played a major league ball game. Never had an at-bat any time in the bigs. And, and based on what I could find, he's getting paid like 55 mil with the potential to get 80 mil before he even steps up to the plate or fields yeah. a ball. $50 million. He signed a $50 million contract. The man has never had an at-bat in Major League Baseball, and the White Sox get out the checkbook for $50 million bucks. Well, they obviously have some confidence in the man. All right, he spent his entire career in A ball, double A. Yes, last year he did lead triple A, I think in batting average or home runs or something like that. But that was the first year that he hit over 30 home runs in, in minor league baseball. But yet the White Sox have stepped up and paid this dude $50 million. Unproven. Unproven. Okay. Okay, now... What is the rising... Oh, by the way, we do have a good show today. He's, Q, he's a Cuban, <laughs> born in 97. Hang on. We do have a good show today. We're going to have Jacob Wall on, and he's on the FLW circuit, and, and a very, very intriguing story has pretty much done everything you need to do to get to this point. Correct, Matthew? Oh, you can take the word pretty much out. <laughs> he has. I got the... I got the, the list here. He started with a club. Well, don't go in the list now. I want to get back on my rant, but I just want to let everybody know we're going to have Jacob Wall on here in about 15 minutes. He's fished at nine different <laughs> levels of FLW, and he's like 26 years old. Yeah, okay, now that's impressive. Back to this Cuban okay, now, sensation. What, let, me what? Hit some, let me hit you some stats. He's born in 97, so okay. he's young. All right. That's it? Yeah. That's all went, you got? Yeah, well, I just didn't know. You said he had spent his whole career, so I thought, oh, maybe he was older. No, no, no. His entire career has been spent in the minor leagues. All right. Now, what is the one thing, actually two things in bass fishing, that we've really seen the most growth in in this game over the past 10 years? Electronics? Technology? No. From an individual standpoint. What is the... Wait, what's the question again? Oh, geez. What is the game... What in the game, from an individual standpoint, have we seen the most growth... In, in probably the, the last 10 years. Sublimated jerseys? Holy. Boat I, dude, sales? I'm talking Boat about sales. people. Boat, people? Yes. Personal growth? <laughs> Not individual growth. Groups. I, you've got me. Oh, my gosh, dude. What did you do at the University of Oklahoma? I don't know if I want to answer that question. <laughs> From a fishing perspective, not what happened on a Friday or Saturday night. And fish collegiately. Okay. Has there not been exponential growth collegiately from a participation level over the past 10 years? Absolutely. Okay. Now there's one more group. Can you figure that one out? I'm just going to go with the theme here and say high school. There you have it. <laughs> Good grief, dude. Man, all right, so you have those two groups, okay? As I roll this back into the fishing scenario, think about this. Now, obviously, nobody, nobody, nobody even realistically thinks that somebody's going to pay somebody that much money. Even Kevin Van Dam doesn't get paid that much money. At least, we don't think so. Anyway, 
Nobody is going to get paid that much money who is unproven at the highest level of professional fishing, even if they have a ton of accolades in the high school and collegiate scene right. or platform right. or whatever. Right. How much longer is it going to take to where we finally see these high school kids going to college? Hence, that's part of the reason why we have Jacob Wall on here, and that's part of the reason why I'm bringing up this scenario, mm-hmm. to where sponsors actually compensate. I'm not talking about giving them a boat to use and then giving them a memo deal or anything like this. Uh, to where they get to the point where they actually earn a living fishing straight out of college all right sign a deal straight out of the the platforms that are in place to gradually move up to the professional level of which you have a strike king or a pure fishing or a pradco seeing this guy going well you know uh he hit 34 home runs in in AAA, man. We need to sign this guy to a massive contract because of the potential. Not that he's proven. Not that he's worth $50 million. But the fact that, hey, man, this dude dominated in the high school and the collegiate ranks. You know what we're going to do? We're going to pay him two grand a month. Well, that's a really easy question to see if it's ever been done because you do have the most dominant collegiate angler in history who went straight to the pro tour in Jordan Lee. I mean, you could just call him. But I, I get that. But he has performed. What I'm talking no, no, about. No, no, I'm talking about, hey, you were sixth in the Bassmaster Classic. You almost won it the year before. Your brother won it. Then you won the bracket the next year. You won the regional events. You had guys like Zona and Mercer and stuff saying, hey, this guy's different. He's going to do big things. I mean, this was being said years before he won the Classics. This was coming straight out of Auburn. So what you're saying is, would a company say, this guy's different, we want him, we're going to pay him $50,000 before he's ever made a cast on the Elite Series, the BPT, the FLW Pro Circuit, to have him in our back pocket so he is a branded X company angler because we know that he's going to be worth the investment. Yeah. I don't know. I did. However, apparently not answer that question well because my dad, who listens to the show, sent me a text. You sound like you are not involved in the show. Are you distracted? I just didn't I was a little understand. perplexed. Man. I just didn't understand the question mark. That was all it was. And I was trying to, to to figure out where you were going and how you were relating it back to this Cuban baseball player in the minor leagues. Dude, they're I mean, paying him jack. They're paying him fifty million dollars. I mean, it and would, the guy hasn't a, uh, he hasn't had a single at bat. It would be interesting to see because what Jordan Lee's came up through the Carhartt College Series ranks. He's with Carhartt. He's been wrapped Carhartt, right? If Carhartt did a big deal with Jordan Lee before he even made his first cast on the Elite Series, I don't think they did. I'm just saying that yeah. would be the one example. That's yeah. what you're. That's what we're kind of co- trying to compare. Yeah, to. yeah. Now I could go off on a totally different tangent about why this is ruining professional sports and baseball in general, and even basketball and football. You're paying these guys a ton of money. You know who's going to end up paying for his fifty million dollar contract? Even though we were what. 1,200 miles from Chicago, Matthew? Who? Whatever we buy that those sponsors get involved with, Mm -hmm. the prices are going up, dude. And that's part of the reason why. We are at a crisis. I say crisis, not really. (laughs) But we are at a situation, all right, where salaries in professional sports are, are absolutely to the point of out of control madness and i have said this before on this show i wish somebody out there that was working on their thesis their doctoral thesis that would actually do some type of research and explanation on how much impact that professional sports salaries for athletes has from an economic perspective because you got to pay those salaries somehow and you know who's paying it we are Because the price of goods goes up because they have to sell the advertising on the the television contracts and everything else. Hell, that's why it costs you 500 bucks to go to a Cowboy game. Is this relatable to – is this just a sports rant? Well, no, I just – I wanted to – I I was kind of frustrated. When I saw that, dude, it pissed me off. 
It did. This guy has done nothing at the level. Nothing at the level. Nothing at the level of the big leagues. And you're writing a check for the dude for $50 million? I would like Are to say, you kidding me? We had $35 standing room only tickets. So <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't I mean, paying the salary. I'm sorry. For that. I open up the show with was we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. 50 yard line. The was, dude has done nothing. 12 deep, two aisles up on a <laughs> row. What's wrong with paying the dude? I don't know, a million bucks? Make friends with your buddy next to him and say, hey, I got to take a leak. Can you just stand a little wider? So Dude, if you go out and you hit 30, 30, you know, 30 dinkers, donks, whatever you want to call it. Uh, home runs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, then, then we can pay you a little more. But $50 million and not even having it in a bat. So that's what got me thinking, folks. Yep. I'm sorry. It's my first rant of 2020. Like I said, I mean, it's, it just, a, it, it it's all re- me off. relatable, though. I mean, if the industry was that big and the, and, and, and the sales of specific baits, products, or goods in the industry did reflect exactly who was using them to that to, to that standpoint, if they saw that type of value in it with the returns, I'm sure it would exist in fishing. But at this point, it doesn't. You're also dealing with there's not really a sure thing in fishing. I mean, you're looking at the greatest angler in the history of, of, of tournament fishing wins <laughs> less than 13% of the time. There's a, there's a post on the instant feedback that says, Mark, it's not your money. Who cares? Ah, my friend, but it is my money because I end up paying, being a fan, I'm the one that ends up paying for these salaries. Jeez. And then Maynard says, why are the owners so stupid? Great question. Great question. Anyway, uh, so that's my comparison, Matthew. Do you kind of see the light on what I was mm-hmm. trying to you know, fall back to? Are we ever going to get to that point? Maybe Jordan Lee is that one guy that had – you know, a big contract from a fishing no, I'm perspective. Just saying he would be Maybe. the guy to ask. That's all I yeah. brought him up because he's – would you not agree that over the past – well, since I've been covering it, yeah. 12, 13 years, yeah. he's the only guy who has, for lack of a better term, been the chosen one yeah. coming out of high school and college before he even made a cast. I mean, no one Probably was really so. surprised at what he did. In the, I mean – Obviously, well, you win a clap, but no one was really like shocked. Like this guy did it. Yeah. Like it's like, oh, this guy did it yeah. at twenty four and twenty five. Here's the old. other thing, man. And I, I'm just gonna. This is the last thing I'm gonna say about this whole professional athlete stuff. At least today, when are we gonna get to a point where the fans finally say, you know what, I'm not paying hundred and fifty bucks for a ticket. Well, I think we're seeing that happen from a cable perspective because I think a lot of people out there obviously are cutting the cord because their cable bill is so high because they got to pay the television contracts by the leagues. It's a great point by Rick. Like, if this is what your next heart attack is going to be caused <laughs> over, you might want to pick something that's a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody said, what about Justin Lucas? Uh, yeah, but Justin Lucas was like in it. Like, he kind of evolved up in it as the co-angler and then turned pro. And, uh, I mean, yeah, he had the, the National Guard deal and stuff uh, when he was fishing as a co-angler on it. But I'm, ta- I'm talking about the straight, you know, collegian, a guy who's not competing at any level, is only competing with the Auburn jersey in the college bass and in, in those arenas, I, I believe is what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. All right. So... It is what it is. All right. Uh, I do want to mention one thing. Uh, we have another guest booked for January. Another guest? Yeah. We only had two open dates. Well, that one open date is not open because I've got to go to the doctor. Okay. Day. So this would be Monday. Because of the rant? <laughs> no. Uh, this would be Monday the 27th, I believe. Okay. All right. We're going to have Mark Davis on. Uh, there is something coming on the wire today that is big news for Mark Davis, and we're going to have him on the show on the 27th. I haven't had him on very much. Yeah, to talk about uh, his new adventure, and let's just say, you could call it a flashback, Matthew. Very cool. Well, we'll just leave it at that. All right. Flashback for Mark Davis. So Mark Davis on the show on January 27th. All right, man, what else is going on? Guys, are, they're chomping at the bit, man. They're down there catching nines and eights and tens yeah, and all kinds of stuff the, in Florida. The Open kicks off in uh, 
eight days. <laughs> and I think the whole damn field is down there already. Yeah, everybody's Florida's getting pounded. Couldn't get, couldn't wait to get out of the uh, the Midwest or the East of the house and get down there and get some early fish. It's a good place to go down and and kind of get back in the swing of things. Um, you've probably got a number of guys who've been hunting the last couple of months. Get back. You've got a bunch of guys with new boats, yeah. new electronics, everything kind of get dialed in. And that gives you kind of a week in stable weather to get all that <laughs> taken care of. I feel like a lot of the Florida lakes kind of fish similarly. So even if you don't want to begin your practice on the Kissimmee chain on Toho right now, you can kind of fish around, get a feel for what stage those fish are in. And they're catching them pretty good, too. So I would expect to see a jam-packed, I know it will be a full field, uh, for that first Eastern Open. Yeah. Rumor is there's between 50 and 60 guys that are planning on fishing all eight of the Open. So They have their own little tournament kind of going on yeah, for they're the year. Kind of, yeah, they've got their own little section. Yeah. They should have to have like a different colored bow like tied to their <laughs> hat so you know, ah, oh, this guy's fishing all of them. Yeah. You remember we used to put orange ribbons on the trolling motor during mm-hmm. tournaments. You we had that? to do that at Cumberland because we were allowed to keep 15-inch smallmouth, and it yeah. was technically considered a research project, uh, yeah. I guess, with the DNR down there. So you tie the ribbon on your bow that allows yeah. you to keep the 15 inches, lets them know, hey, this guy's allowed to have 15 and not 18 inches in the yeah. live well. All right, very nice. All right, we're going to take a break. Come back with Jacob Wall here on Tuesday. Everybody stay tuned. serious about catching fish that hds is a dead giveaway you've got the best fish finding sonar money can buy time to build the ultimate fish finding system with live sight sonar see what your lure is doing in real time watch fish strike as it happens see for yourself take the live sight sonar 30-day challenge if live sight sonar doesn't help you find and catch more fish send it back no questions asked Yeah, you care about gear ratios, inches per turn and ball bearings, but most importantly, you want reliability and dependability in the equipment you use. Lose doesn't cut corners when it comes to the gear they build. The new Speed Spool LFS is the best $99 reel in the market. Go see for yourself. We've paired one of the most iconic hulls in the history of bass boats with a proven lineup of trusted accessories. We're bringing you best-in-class value and performance, leaving others in your wake. Turnkey value, turnkey performance. The Pantera 2 is an overachiever in the 19-foot category. Once you hit the throttle, you'll feel the rush, and there's no looking back. Kevin, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just filling in for Billy. I need a 660 Shad crankbaits in uh, the Series 5 model. We're out. You're not out. You got all kinds of them right there. We're out. Kevin, I need six. Have a lollipop. I do not want a lollipop. Have a lollipop. Do you have it in sexy shad color? At Duckett Fishing, we have assembled the top pros in the country to help us design rods to give you a competitive advantage. Castability, strength, durability, action, sensitivity, weight and balance, and consistency. Combine that with the best warranty in the industry and you have rods that are pro-driven. Duckett Fishing, pro-driven. I want to share to you a new product we got coming out from Sunline. This is the FC leader size spools that we have now. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests for this. A lot of you guys use fluorocarbon for leaders only, myself included. And one of the problems you have is when you have a 200 yard spool, that might last you two, three, four years. You might even lose it before you even get done with the spool. So we've gone to a little smaller spool. These are 50 yard spool sizes. You know, that way you're not holding your line on forever. You can keep your line fresh, use it when you can. Stores real easily in the boat. We got all of our popular line sizes that you're used to with our sniper from five to 14 pound. If you guys are looking for a line that you're only tying for a leader, 
Go check out Sunline FC Leader 100% fluorocarbon and give it a try. Blue Water by TH Marine. Offering LED lighting solutions for your boat, trailer, truck, ATV, and so much more. Engineered and built to be rugged with waterproof and submersible options. Designed for easy installation, Blue Water is available in a variety of colors and styles. All backed by a limited lifetime warranty. Blue Water by TH Marine. The name Spro says it all. Spro stands for Sports Professionals. When you look at the, the pro staff that Spro has brought on board over the past 15 years, it's been pretty incredible. And I mean, one got it just then. From the development of the rock crawler to the McStick, from the fat pop of the Little John series, when you tie a Spro bait on, you know it's been designed by a professional to get the job done. I got my power pole down Stuck in the mud in the bottom of the lake Sitting so still in the wind and the waves Could even be a hurricane I got my power pole down Meet AFCO's iCast award-winning Hydronaut waterproof system Hydronaut features a 20K 100% waterproof shell Double dry cuffs to keep water out Speed vent hood engineered to prevent neck strain at high rates of speed. AFCO exclusive Cyclops tactical camera mount. Comfort flex shoulder straps for all day comfort. Outerwear that you can count on. The Hydronaut waterproof system by AFCO. Any fish, any water. All of us on the Pro Tournament Trail use Gamigatsu hooks. Why? Because they are absolutely the best. It's not about how many bites you get, it's how many you put in the boat. Gamakatsu makes hooks for every fishing style. We didn't come this far to lose fish. Did you? For more information, visit gamakatsu.com. Tuesday! And I got a few new tunes there, Matthew. Yeah, I like, like that it. one. That's good, a little good vibe. What, what kind of music is that? It's not jazz. What is it? <laughs> it's like a 70s detective show or something. I don't know. There's got to be a style for it, doesn't there? I don't know what it is. Jazz. Like, do you hear anybody who listens to this stuff, like, in their car? Like, have you ever gotten no. in someone's car, like, on the way to the tournament and it's like this type of stuff? Never. I think Never. my uncle might listen to some of this <laughs> stuff. But he was a saxophone player. Really? Yeah. I've told you this. In a oh, in a jazz, jazz band? band? Really? Yeah. Uh, there's some cool jazz out there. I've listened to it a little bit. but I, I mean, I'm all over the place when it comes to music. All right. Uh, we are ready for our second guest of 2020. And, uh, man, this guy, he, he's done it all, Matthew. Yeah, working I, his way up. I mean, I I, kind of, I knew who he was, but had not done any of the kind of background research. Didn't really know this story. Yeah, I just knew that he'd fish for Phil Knight <laughs> out there at the Oregon Ducks. I wonder how many fishing jerseys they had. Do you think they had alternate jerseys for the fishing team? Was like Phil Knight or, even involved? Like six or seven different jerseys. It, it would have been fishing cool. Team? Yeah, by the, the yellow way, one, and of, green Nikes. one of the coolest basketball floors mm -hmm. in the country, the Oregon Ducks. We'll have so, to ask him that. He lives in Alabama now. But anyway, he's been yeah. involved at every level from the time he was 12 years old in a, in a club. He's fished the, the, the TBF juniors, the high school, the collegiate, BFLs, FLW series as a co-angler, the FLW series, and the pro circuit last year, where he had a solid year. Yeah. I mean, he was like a fish or two away in like six out of the seven tournaments from having yeah. a really good year, finished 55th in the points, and now he's entering his sophomore year on the FLW pro yeah. circuit. All right, let's bring him in. Jacob, you there, man? Yeah, Mark and Matt, how are you guys doing? Doing well, man. Uh, appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, first time on BTL, we tried to get the Skype thing going, but 
uh, didn't have any luck on that. So uh, this will work, man. And uh, I, I, I'm really intrigued. Uh, when I was looking to book guests for the month of January, I, I ran across uh, a lot of your background. And, and the thing that stuck out, there was a lot of stuff that I, I noticed, but there was a video that I saw on the web that you were fishing in Oregon out of what looked like it was a 19... 19- 73 Glastron or something <laughs> with a guy okay, that yeah. with a guy that had a television show I guess out there in Oregon and you were you were absolutely smashing him with this guy oh yeah was that a I believe it was uh it was like a gold colored boat yes that one? yes that's it yeah that that's actually that's my old boat um that was the first fiberglass bass boat that my uh my dad and i ever bought and that's what i started fishing tournaments well i started fishing tournaments out of an aluminum but that's sort of what i fished uh i actually fished college tournaments out of that thing it was an old bayliner i don't even they call it a trophy i think bayliner trophy and it was like a 16 and a half foot bass boat wow it, um, it, it didn't even look like a bass boat though it looked like a like a fishing ski or something it, it's a weird well you know bayliner they they originally i think they just typically make you know ski boats and then a couple of fishing ski models but for a while like a i don't know a handful of years they made bass boats and and the the look of them wasn't much different than their fishing ski but um it, it just had big windscreens but it, it had a pretty decent sized front deck and shoot man i made it work i actually did pretty well in some college tournaments down on clear lake out of that boat I remember one tournament. We were running down to the uh, the narrower part of Clear Lake, and we had we had such a long run in that boat that we actually had to stop at a little gas dock on the way just to fuel up because I think we didn't not hold enough gas. On Clear Lake, uh, wow! On Clear Lake, what did, what did it have on it? Uh, like a ninety horse or a one fifteen or something? Yeah, when we fished out of it in college, it had a ninety Evinrude on it, and then that motor. Uh, had some issues and we had to replace it and it's got like an 80 mercury on it now wow so you still have the boat the boat's still around yeah yeah my mom and dad still have it um they kind of just keep it around and it's pretty cool actually because living out here in alabama i've got my boat obviously yeah but when i go visit home um i can kind of just hop in that boat and it kind of brings back some nostalgia, and it's pretty cool. All right, man. Uh, tell the fans, tell tell Matt and I, how did you get into this game? And, and you really have done it all when you look at your career on the path to get where you are today. How did this whole thing start? Well, it all kind of just started with my interest in fishing. Um, you know, at a young age, my dad got me involved in, in just fishing in general. I was born up in... Seattle, Washington, and he did a lot of, you know, salmon, steelhead, trout fishing up there, and so that's sort of what he introduced me to, so I was born kind of into the fishing world, uh, so to speak, but when I was probably 10, 11 years old, I started watching some television shows, I believe, like Bill Dance and Roland Martin and all your kind of original television, you know, guys that were doing bass fishing, and I, I think I watched some tournaments as well, and it just really intrigued me how how active you you know you are while you're fishing for bass how quickly you can move around and how you're constantly casting and retrieving and uh, more like hunting for the fish rather than waiting for the fish and i enjoyed fishing but i didn't really like the whole idea of just casting out there and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and that's sort of how salmon fishing is if you've ever done that and um it, it's just not my cup of tea, I guess. I mean, it, it's okay, but it's just not something that I got a heck of a lot of enjoyment out of. And so bass fishing just really intrigued me. And so I think when I was around 11 or maybe, yeah, probably around 11, my dad and I started kind of getting involved in it together. Um, he, he, you know, he saw my interest in it. I explained to him that I wanted to try to do it. And so we ended up buying some, you know, some bass fishing gear. I think the first, this is crazy. I mean, the first lures, I think we started fishing were like hula poppers. Um, I think we started throwing hula poppers like we'd go out to these local ponds and we would go out there in the evening and throw hula poppers and I think once we started getting bit on those top waters I mean it got my dad hooked as well I mean who doesn't enjoy seeing like a three or four pound bass come crush a top water I mean, exactly just, exactly 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that just gets you hooked the moment you see it. And so we did that for a while, bank fished for probably a year. And then I got, you know, to the point where I was like, man, I want to do this. You know, I want to see where I can go with this. I want to do this competitively. I've, all, I've always been a competitive person. And so we kind of looked into local clubs and we found this local club called Crater Bass Club and we, we went to a meeting and from there we basically joined the club and met some people in the club. They seemed like really good uh, family friendly people and so they invited us you know, to, to join the club and we went to one of the first tournaments. Uh, it was actually on Applegate Lake in Oregon, uh, which to this day is one of my favorite lakes to fish. It's got smallmouth and largemouth, but primarily it's a smallmouth fishery. And uh, we started there. We went out on uh, this guy Duke Barris's boat. It was the first tournament I ever fished when I was twelve, and it was we had, we were all three in the boat. My dad, uh, wow. you know, myself, and then Duke. And we we kind of just went out for fun more than anything. And if I remember correctly, I believe we ended up getting second place in that that tournament. Uh, obviously, it's just a club tournament. You know, there's not a not a ton of competition. Only ten or eleven, twelve boats or something. Um, but that was kind of what kicked it off. And then, I mean, I just ran with it from there, man. I, the, the, the next thing I did, really, I mean, I did a lot of club tournaments for a while. Um, I think up until I was around 17 or so, I did club tournaments, you know, locally. And I got to the point where I fished them by myself to kind of challenge myself more. I would compete against these teams by myself, and I did pretty well doing that. I won a few. Um, and so I was just kind of trying to build my confidence as an angler and but between that point and when i started tournaments i did what was called casting kids i don't know if you remember that or not oh matt uh, does i do yeah it, basically it was just a target casting competition they don't do it anymore um, but that's what i did for three years and i made it to nationals uh every time i did it and i, I believe that i got i i I can't remember exactly, but I know I was up there in like top, you know, 10 guys in the nation for casting, target casting. And I, I mean, I've always, ever since that, I've always prided myself in, you know, being really good mechanically with a fishing rod. And, and, and so that really taught me, you know, accuracy. And I mean, I just kind of, like I said, climbed the ranks. I started there, you know, club stuff, went to casting kids, got my kind of fundamentals really dialed in. I mean, I practiced day in and day out for that casting stuff. We would actually go to a local church that had a bunch of room in it, and they would let us use the church to, to target casting when it was cold out, and when it wasn't, I'd do it in the driveway. And I was practicing as much as I could for that stuff. And um, Then I did junior level, like you said. You kind of listed it all off. Yeah, I listed, yeah. I listed everything. That, yeah, man. I mean, I just my whole thing is is I wanted to be consistent. I wanted to you know, continue to work my way up through the ranks. And I think not only does it prove to myself that I can, you know, keep climbing the ladder and making it to that point. I mean, obviously the, the, the climax of it is the, you know, what I'm doing now, the, the you know, what is it? The pro circuit mm -hmm. or your BPT or your, uh, you know, elite guys or your top tier guys. And that's kind of where I was shooting for. And it's pretty surreal to feel, you know, feel like I've accomplished that at, you know, such a young age. I, I know two years ago I was talking to my girlfriend and I was telling her, you know, man, I'm just, I don't know if I'll ever get there. I don't, you know, I don't know, you know, how long this is going to take. And then that first year of fishing posted, I was shocked that I, you know, qualified. I mean, it's just such a surreal thing, man. I mean, working my whole life to get here and then finally being able to, you know, say that that's the level that I'm pushing. It's pretty cool. I kind of did a timeline because obviously now there's a lot of emphasis in, in the industry on a, a, with a, both organizations on a stepping stone of, of getting kids, giving them a clear path, kind of a destination that they can get to, whether that's the elites or the BPT. So, like, you started fishing that, that club stuff when you were 12, and I'll just do a quick timeline to show this is exactly how it's supposed to work. You were, like, the, <laughs> the poster child of it, getting involved with the Casting Kids, which was a free event for Bassmasters. I'm assuming you got to go to the Bassmaster Classic for that, too, and, like, got kind of got I it. I did, yeah, that that was a really cool thing you know it got me in, in, introduced to a lot of these guys and i mean that lit my eyes up you know i was like whoa this is so cool you know 
so, so you have that. Then you, you go to the, the TBF Junior Championships in 2008, then 2011, 12, 13 high school, then 14, 15, 16 college, then 18 FLW series, and then your rookie year in 19. So it's kind of cool to see. Like when you started this, were you like, I'm going to do – the, the, the juniors, the high school, the college, the BFLs, the Costas, and then make it to the tour? Is this just kind of something that like every year it just kind of seemed like a natural progression to you? And before you know it, you had just competed at everything and, and kind of seamlessly transitioned from a 10-year-old casting at a bullseye target to competing against Thrift and Dudley on the tour? It, it didn't really like come together in my mind when I was younger that this is how I would get, go about it. But I knew that I wanted to you know, competitively fish where whatever, I, you know, whatever age I was at. And it just kind of worked out that, you know, that lined up and that's, you know, I just kind of climbed the ranks, I guess. I mean, I just did what was, you know, available and what made sense. And that's just kind of how it ended up working out. One of the things that I found when I was doing some research on you that, that was really impressive, and I remember when this happened, because there's a picture of you and you're holding two trophies for the Western Regional in 2016, um, and you fished by yourself and beat all the other college teams in, like, the major regional, correct? Yeah, yeah that was on Lake Mead. Um, that, was, that was one of the highlights of my career so far as an angler, to be honest with you. Did that kind of give you a little boost in confidence? I mean, I, I fish collegiately for the University of Oklahoma and know how it is and know, like, I mean, that's a three-day event. That's one of the That was one of the first years they had the big regionals. I mean, that had to be big for you and, and your confidence. And then I want to relate a question after you answer that back to something in the first segment that we talked about. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a huge confidence boost. Um, you know, that tournament was pretty cool because I had never been to Lake Mead. I didn't get any information going into it. I, I generally go like, you know, approach lakes that way. I, I try to, I pride myself in doing everything on my own 95% of the way, you know? And so just being able to go out on a lake that large and being able to dial something in for three days. And, you know, not only did I, I walk away with the W on that, but I consistently had a heavy bag every day, which is, you know, it's something that's very, really, very, very difficult to do at this sport, as you guys know. Um, typically, you know, you run out of fish by the end of the day or the, the third day and you're, you're kind of scratching and pecking and you might have a, a decent bag, but, you, you know, not as much as you did the first or the second day. But I increasingly got heavier each day. And uh, I just I felt like in that event, I proved myself that I, I could make really good, clean decisions in a tournament. And I had, you know, that right mindset to, to pull a win like that off. Like, did you get any, did anybody call you after that? Like from the university, like <laughs> at that or, or sponsorship wise, we were talking about guys getting, getting noticed in college, like getting deals before they even turn pro or anything. Yeah. I mean, that would be like, I would think an accomplishment that maybe sponsors would take notice of or something and be like, Hey, this dude just kicked everyone's butt by himself. Let's throw some stuff his way. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Thinking back on it, I didn't have any sponsors contact me. Um, but I did have some, you know, some press guys contact me. I had some, a few different, I believe there was a couple different online, like, articles that I was written in. And locally, I believe I was in two different, like, newspaper articles. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get any sponsorship outreach. Um, I, I have just had to work for that stuff in, this, in the industry. I, I mean, I have, nothing has come easy to me. I, I'm very, very few of the sponsors that I've had over the years that actually approached me. It's all been my hard work and, you know, approaching them, but unfortunately nobody approached me after that. Oh, okay. One more question. That, that's that, my point. That, anyway, that we'll get into that. One more question then. So you're with Oregon, you fish it. Obviously, Oregon's known for their swag, their jerseys, their yeah. facilities, all that. Do they hook the bass club up with like anything on that? You get like three or four jerseys. Did you Phil get, and like, I take care of you? Like windbreakers, anything? <laughs> You know, I'd love to be able to sit here and say, oh, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, we get all this, you know, awesome hats and jerseys and you name it. But uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. We didn't, you know, it was it was pretty much all on our shoulders. The bass fishing team is pretty much under the radar. I don't even know if half the people that work in the school knew that it existed. Um, you know, I, I would go into a class at the beginning of the term and tell the, the teacher, hey, I'm going to be gone these days for, for tournaments. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, I fish on the bass fishing team. And they're like, what? 
you know, nobody even really knew what it was. So, um, unfortunately, no. I, I mean, I we did as much as we could, but you know how it is going to college, Matt, that, I mean, you're so caught up with everything else that you can only do so much with your time. Mm-hmm. And so I was pretty much just limited to fishing. And, and when I'd be home, I was doing schoolwork and working on school stuff, but we never did get supported by, you know, Phil Knight directly. Uh, <laughs> we, we designed our jerseys ourselves. We just had like one or two jerseys and that was it. Okay, uh, Dave has posted like three or four times on the instant feedback. He wants to know, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correct or not, uh, Riff Lake or Rife Lake? Oh, R- Rife Lake. Okay. Yeah, I've never fished it before. I've heard of it, though. Okay, and then he also wants to know, and, and I'm kind of curious, too, the move to Alabama. Number one, why did you move to Alabama? And two, he wants to know, has it been – difficult to get used to all the uh, TVA lakes? Uh, so the main reason I moved to Alabama was just to get more centralized for the tour. Um, I knew financially it just didn't make sense for me to stay in Oregon, and, and not only financially, but you know, mileage on my vehicle and my trailer and all that other stuff, and being away from family. Uh, you know, I, I had My girlfriend and I lived together, and it would just have been hard on us if I was gone for you know, six or seven months out of a year. And so this way it allows us to kind of see each other every couple of weeks. I'll go on, you know, go to a tournament, come home for a few days, go to another tournament, practice or something, come home for a couple of days. So it just kind of gives a home base. Um, and then also I wanted to be on a lake that was going to be able to teach me more than what I already knew. And Gunnersville is, an, uh, you know, an extremely well-known uh, grass lake as well as a, a really good ledge fishing lake and those are two things that I had very little experience doing coming from Oregon and so I wanted to expand my knowledge on that and as far as getting used to the TBA I don't even know I, I, I mean guys live here their whole lives and I don't know if you can ever get used to the TBA it is such a weird fishery it is such a weird fishery man um i enjoy the heck out of it i love going out and fishing gunners though i spend as much time out there as i can um but it it changes so drastically day in and day out uh you know one day you'll have current flowing pretty hard and the fish will be moving on you know the edges of current breaks and not like a typical river system current break they set up differently uh but they'll, they'll change you know change positions and then the very next day we'll get you know an inch and a half of rain and they'll drop the lake out three feet and the fish will be on the, you know, just completely move the fish around. Um, and then two days later, the lake's back to full pool and the fish are up on top of humps and the current's not running and they're back in the creeks heavier. You know, it's just, it's constantly changing, um, which I think is good. It allows me to expand as an angler and keeps me on my toes, but it's a really hard lake to get a grasp on, I guess. Were you a big fan of like the the kind of up northwest guys like the Jay Yellis and Luke Clawson and stuff there, Washington and Oregon growing yeah. up? Yeah, I know Jay pretty well actually. I believe when I was what was I sixteen or seventeen? Might have been yeah, right around then because there was when I qualified to fish a nationals on Lake. I think it was Lake Monticello or Lake Murray. It was one of the two. It might have been Monticello, but I contacted Jay to see if I could get some information about, you know, just fishing in the south. I had never fished in the south at that point. And so it wasn't even necessarily about the lake, just sort of what to expect going to the south because I knew he traveled all over. And uh, he actually was on his way through my, you know, part of Oregon down there in Medford. And we stopped and had lunch, and he kind of gave us, uh, my dad and I met up with him and gave us a good, like, understanding of maybe what to expect going out there and so i've always had like a pretty decent connection with jay and ever since then i've you know stayed in you know not up you know super close contact and i'll call him all the time but you know we we have a, a decent little relationship and as far as luke goes i mean i've always you know followed him as an angler but i never have had a personal connection with him all right but um I'm, other, I'm other sorry, guys like ahead. Oh, no, no, you're good. I kind of stopped for a sec. But, like, Justin Lucas and I have been buddies for a long time because he used to announce for the uh, college guy, and so I met him in college. And then Justin stepped up and started fishing the, you know, the higher-level stuff, the elites, and 
and I've always followed Justin, and now he lives down here, kind of near mm-hmm. me. And so I'm, I'm buddies with Justin. Um, you know, there's a handful of guys from California that I'm pretty good friends with. Yeah, rumor is Justin's still fishing, not just grilling. <laughs> for people out there, I don't know if you follow his social media, it's about ninety five percent Traeger and about five percent fishing. That's funny. That's funny. All right, man. Uh, real quick, I, I'd like to know what is the one stop that you're looking forward to the most in 2020. Oh man, um, I was thinking about this the other day. Actually, I was talking to my buddy Ryan Salzman, and he did a little uh, phone interview with me as well, and asked me the same question. And um, I don't know. I, I kind of had a couple of on the on my radar. Really, the first one that I, I mentioned to him that I still think is probably the top of the list for me is, is Cherokee Lake um, in Tennessee. I'm just really looking forward to getting back there. We fished that last season and I felt like I, I just missed the mark by just a such a slim margin there. I mean, I, I barely missed a check and I just I made the wrong decisions that first day for about three hours and I knew that I was making the wrong decisions after about an hour and I just got stubborn and you know, that's something I really learned this year is sort of the mindset going into these tournaments, you know, and how you need to approach it. And obviously that's something you grow, you know, or you, you kind of change as you grow as an angler. And um, I'm just really looking forward to getting back there because it sets up so similarly to what I'm used to in Oregon and California. It's a drawdown reservoir. It's a lot of rocks, a lot of, you know, points and humps and breaks and just hard structure and docks and i'm just really used to that kind of fish and it sets up just like what i'm familiar with and i just think i need to get a little little redemption out there i mean i think i ended up in 77th or something like that and right at the end of the day on that second day i i lost like a four pounder at the boat it like basically jumped over my net and uh you know it was just such a heartbreaker and i I left that event knowing i left stuff on the table knowing i made poor decisions for three hours and that cost me a lot and i felt like i found the winning stuff i just didn't find it early enough and i didn't make the right decisions and i just really want to get back there and, and get a little redemption on them and um besides that you know i'm really excited for rayburn just because Ooh, you know, I, I, Rayburn's got absolute giants in it, and same kind of deal last year. You know, with Rayburn, I was really close to cutting a check there. Um, I just didn't find the right quality of fish, and I think I have a much better understanding this year of what I need to go do. And I, I believe the lake's setting up better now than it did last year. Last year it was like nine feet high or something in the trees, and it was ridiculous. And the, the hydrilla was out in like twelve to sixteen <laughs> feet of water. Yeah, Matt knows. Matt knows. <laughs> Fish that coast of there when it was six foot high. Yeah, he did real well. All right, man, uh, we're about out of time, but real quick, uh, are you fishing anything else besides the circuits? You know, I'm I'm, I'm primarily focusing on the circuit, but um, I'll fish local stuff here on Gunnersville. Um, any kind of little opens I can get into, any kind of, uh, you know, side little basically just open tournaments um i might jump into a bfl if there's something nearby uh, but primarily just going to focus on the, the circuit just to kind of put all my my ducks in one or all my what is it all my eggs in one basket yeah. i guess that's what they say ducks yeah. in a row I, I, I need to i need to bring this up i'm gonna give give you and jeffries a chance to bond here because jeffries is all about education <laughs> it's all about money and education that's right and I found a, a, an article, uh, just kind of doing some research, that Kyle Wood, their great, uh, great, great writer, kind of reporter there for uh, for MLFLW, now yeah. wrote, and, and he did it before your rookie year, and there was a quote in there. Did you did you see this I quote that it. he had? Yeah. You know where I'm going with this? Yeah, keep going. He said, "I wanted to go pro seriously since I was 20 years old." Is this the same quote? I think so. I yes. wanted to go pro seriously since I was 20 years old. I'm glad I stuck it out through college and got my degree instead of trying to force a professional career too soon. What what advice yeah. what advice would you give other collegiate anglers or aspiring high school anglers obviously based upon that quote? I mean, your education is, is hugely important in not just fishing, but just in, in life in general. And I mean, 
I mean, I don't know if this is something that I'll be able to do my entire, you know, career, my entire life. I, I'd love to be able to get to that point, you know, to where this is what I do for my, you know, my whole life. But I, I don't know where everything's going to fall. I don't know what the, what, you know, the, what, ha- what it has in store. So I guess having a degree is something to kind of fall back on. It gives me, gives me that, you know, kind of cushion to where if I don't, you know, end up doing this 10 years from now, I still have that degree to, to go back on and I have, you know, an education to kind of use um, to potentially find some other job. I, I'd love to stay in the industry. That's that's my goal. And so maybe, you know, maybe that helps me find another, you know, avenue in the industry. Um, and just having that education proves to people that, hey, you can commit to something, you can follow through, you can finish something. And, uh, you know, you've got this, this degree to prove it and that's that's really huge man I, I think that's super important just in life in general what's your degree in can you say uh my degree is in product design and fine art and so i basically i like working with my hands i like making stuff and i i kind of was thinking about it in the in terms of like potentially working with a you know, uh, a fishing company designing product is sort of where I was headed. Oh, you very, do like very nice. swim baits and stuff like that, don't you? I do. Yeah, I just uh, I've been making them for years, but I just probably about two and a half, three months ago started getting into making them and selling them. And uh, that's something that I'm actually going to probably end up pursuing on the side. You know, when I'm not tournament fishing, but it's it's fun, man. Yeah, it's just a lot of. Right now, I'm you know carving and working with silicone and molding stuff, and kind of starting to get into the resin, you know, swim baits. But uh, the swim bait market is it's kind of an interesting market. It's not the same as your tournament anglers, but there's a huge, huge uh, what is it? Uh, I guess following for swim baits, and there's there's a lot of guys that are involved in in collecting and buying and fishing those big baits more than you would think. Uh, you know, but that's something that I'm doing now. All right, real quick, I I, I kind of know are are there fish in Crater Lake? There are fish in Crater Lake. Yeah, I believe they're trout. I think they're rainbow trout. I don't know exactly all the species, but I believe there's rainbow trout in there. And no I think bass. They're pretty dang big. No bass. Is though, that where right? you no went? Bass. Yeah, you saw it. Yeah. No bass though. It's pretty. It, no, no bass. Uh, but it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. All right, now, last question. Besides yourself, who is the most famous person to come from Medford, Oregon? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> his, nickname, his, nick, his nickname was the Medford Meteor. Oh, he played basketball, didn't he? No. Did he run? No. No. Was he no, an he's still alive. He's still alive. He was an astronomist? No. The Medford Meteor. That was his nickname. <laughs> I, I couldn't even tell you. I, I don't know. All it right. Was his name was before it, my time. No, it, it, his name was Marshall Holman, and he's probably okay. one of the greatest professional bowlers of all time. Oh, but, no kidding. Yeah. Okay. From Medford, Oregon, of all places. So, yeah, Marshall Holman. Bowlers know who Marshall Holman is. So. Interesting. The Medford Meteor. Cool. Well, uh, you learn something new every day. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Obviously, he never ran into Mr. Mr. Marshall Holm in there, Matthew. <laughs> no, did not cross paths in their selected <laughs> occupations. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, man. We we really appreciate you taking time out. Uh, and hopefully, man, go out, do well. We'll get you back on the show. And uh, best of luck to you in 2020, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, I can... I can guarantee you this next time when you get me back on the show that I'll I'll work my butt off to get that Skype going because I want to be able to do a video thing. This yeah, is, this is cool, but it would have been nice to do the video. But next time we'll make it happen. Get the video back on. Yeah. You can show some of the baits that you make. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. We we'll get you back on, man. Go out, do well in 2020. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, hey thanks, guys. All I right. appreciate it. Have All a good right. rest of your day. All right, man. Take care. There you have it. Jacob Wall and uh, I know what you're going to say now. What's that? You're going to say that you're highly impressed. <laughs> the dude's got he's got his game together, man. It sounds like everything right in plan, right right on. I don't want to say right on schedule, but he he. If anybody out there is wanting to take this path, they need to research him. 
This is this ha- would have to be so frustrating because it's rookie season. You know, you're you just moved. You're trying to cash checks. You know, you're hanging in there. It's like 150 whatever guys. He had yeah. like 28 thousand on the tour, but he had finishes at 75th, 62nd, 71st, 56th. 26th, 105th, and 86th. In six of those seven terms, one he ca- ca- cast a check in, but in five of those seven tournaments, he was one bite away yeah. from having really good tournaments. Just one bite. And you talk about, you look at the difference of that 60th and 40th place. I mean, you can go back and look at the standings on all those that yeah. are just stacked, stacked, stacked. I mean, you're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars difference. You're talking the difference between the Forest Wood Cup, rest in peace, and not making the Forest Wood Cup and, and, and the Rookie of the Year mix and everything. Yeah, yeah. Quick story about Marshall Holman, real quick. Some people what was his nickname? The Medford Meteor. Did he throw a hard ball or something? Uh, his heyday was back in the 70s and 80s. Well, yeah, he was way before. He <laughs> said, was he before my time? And you said, yeah. not really. Well, well he's, he's still alive, like dude. 25, he, 26 he, years he old. He still Jacob does is. television. He does some of the TV broadcasts okay. that are on CBS and on uh, Fox, not Fox, but the CBS broadcast. Okay. Anyway, he sustained the largest PBA fine in the history of the PBA. All right. Any idea what he did? F bomb on air? No, he did that all the time. That was just a hundred dollar fine. Steroids? <laughs> no, no. Now on a bowling lane, and you're going to have to kind of get a visual on this. All right, on a bowling lane, there is a thing called the foul lights. Oh, There's, I've seen the video of this. All right, on the TV show, on the ABC show, he punts the foul light. That was the Medford Meteor. That was the Medford Meteor. He kicks. He kicks it like a like a. Kicker kicking a field goal, yeah, and just kicks it, and it's what, what, it's what, it's like a laser that goes across, right. the, whether your foot goes across, and right, it goes beep or something, and he wasn't, yeah. he didn't like the shoes or the way the oil was around the something lane or happened. something, yeah, and he punted it, he punted the down foul the lane, line. yeah, I remember how much fun. was the, uh, I, it, it was like. Twenty thousand dollars. They charged. They gave him twenty thousand oh, yeah. for that. And he got suspended. It God. was a big, big, Damn, big. It's deal. a good thing I can Ellie doesn't bowl. <laughs> well, somebody said on the instant feedback. Who was it? Uh, let's see here. Dennis in Illinois said Marshall Holman, the Ike of bowling. Yeah, I think I think the video is still out there on YouTube of uh, when he punted the foul line and he and he got. I think it was a twenty. Yeah, no, I've fine. seen it. Yeah, that because was the Medford Meteor, man. One of the things that I got distracted with, probably, this was recent, like probably a couple months ago. I'm over there. I'm editing the little recap for the show yeah. that goes out on Facebook, and I end up seeing Recommended for You, and it's a bowling thing. Anyway, I go down this wormhole, and I end up watching like the top 20 biggest meltdowns in professional bowling history. You know, all the Walter Ray with the sunglasses, and yeah. the guys go, you know, glaring at people in the stands. P. Weber. That one was like number one. Yeah. Yeah, the crotch chop, you yep, know, yep. And, and all that and everything. So very, very interesting. Uh, you know, small town though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like more Medford. Yeah. Same year, uh, different year, same stuff. I mean, we got minor league <laughs> baseball contracts. We got bowling meltdowns. We got educational talk. Yeah, it's all good, man. All right, let me. I'm a little out of sync here. Get the music queued up. So uh, that was a good one, Mark. Yeah. I'm impressed that you did some homework. I did. I did. That guest in. Yeah. Good dude, man. Like I said, if you're really interested on the path, let's just call it the path. We do have one open date in January, right? Still. I think we're fully booked. Okay. Because but, we still have two guys on the docket that were supposed to be on. Who's that? Latimer. Yes. You got to rebook him. Yeah. And we still got to get Austin Felix on. Yeah, it's probably going to happen in February. All right. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get those guys on. All right. I want to thank everybody. Great stuff on the instant feedback today. And uh, tomorrow, Jacob Wheeler, MVP. Remember the wrestler named MVP? I did not. That was before <laughs> my time. He grew up with Marshall Holman there in Medford. <laughs> All right. Good show tomorrow. Jacob Wheeler on. Same time. Everybody be safe. That's it. We're out of here.